Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we're going to continue our study on Daniel's last vision, but we're addressing uh, the beasts in Revelation, the seven-headed and ten-horned beasts. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? The dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence here this morning as we open your word together. We know, Lord, that there is much that we need to study and understand. And we pray, Lord, that the things that we study will draw us close to you, that we can know your presence and the reality of your love in our lives, that we can reflect this to others. We pray, Lord, for each person. We pray for this movement and your work upon this earth. Help us to play our part in that work and um, to understand and share your truth with others. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again, everyone. So yesterday we just, you know, we addressed a couple of points. One was that, you know, Jeff is going to continue posting articles. He posted another one today. Um, and, and that we're not going to go, be going through his articles, but occasionally we'll refer to something that he said if it relates to our studies, um, which which is the case today as well. We're going to look at just something he said, but not, not right away. We're going to address Revelation 12. And uh, we had touched on the pioneer understanding of this. Um, so we're going to read over some of this, and then we're going to look at uh, other places in the scriptures, and then we're going to read again uh, some of the interpretations that we have of Revelation chapter 12. So, of course, we know that the beasts in Revelation 12, 13, and 17 share similar characteristics, that is, in the number of heads and the number of horns. Uh, but there's many things that are different about these beasts. And pretty much any interpretation I've seen of these beasts, um, people are going to just equate it somehow as this, the heads are the same and, and, the, and the horns are the same. Even though the beast itself has, you know, in this case, it's a great red dragon. In chapter 13, it's going to be this composite beast with, you know, body like a leopard, uh, feet like a bear, a mouth like a lion, and um, the dragon is going to give it its power, seat, and great authority. And then in Revelation 17, you're going to have a woman riding a beast, a scarlet-colored beast with seven heads and ten horns, but no crowns. And I've always found it odd that people just sort of label everything the same. But maybe, maybe we could. Um, but one thing we do know is that they are at different times. So this one here would be in the time of pagan Rome, is how we've always understood it. The one in Revelation 13 is in 1798. And the one in Revelation 17 is in our time, at the end of the world. <clears throat> and, and this, of course, uh, needs to, to have a part to play in interpreting what the heads and, and the horns are. So... Um, so first, when we look at Revelation 12, verse 1, we talked about this yesterday. There's this woman. Now, it's a great wonder in heaven. Now, now John is, of course, in vision. And um, he's been in vision this, this whole time in Revelation. As far as I know, it's one vision. There's sometimes he has conversations with an angel. Um, but sometimes he just has visions. And here he's just going to describe a vision. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head, the crown of 12 stars. So we look at this symbolically. The woman represents a church. And in this case, what church would she represent and why?
So we have lots of other scriptures that we can look at. Um, so if you go to, you know, I think it's, I was looking at it earlier. Isaiah, um, you know, Isaiah 54, verse 5 and 7, For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy, thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth shall he be called. And the Lord hath called thee a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth when thou wast refused, saith, the, saith thy God. Right. Um, we have uh, Hosea chapter 2, verse 19 to 20. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment, in loving kindness and mercies. So we can find lots of places in John 3, 29. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. Right. So all of these symbols about this woman being uh, uh, a church. Right. So there's lots more verses than what it, what's here in the Treasury of Scripture knowledge references. Um, Now, what about where we place this in time? How do we place Revelation 12 in time? Like, how do we know when this is happening? She being and, and she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So where do we place this? Time-wise, and why? Well, aspects of it relate to even before the time the earth was created, and then this year woman given birth, we understand that's going to be Christ, so we're going to relate it to 4 BC or even when she's pregnant, maybe like 5 maybe late 5 BC maybe Okay, so so here where it says and his, his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did just cast them to the earth um, we would say that that's going to go back to the past so it's just describing characteristics of this um this great red dragon right it's not placing that uh drawing a third part of the stars as the same time uh, that this woman is going to deliver a child right is that what we would say or are we going to try to place this this drawing a third part of the stars as as happening at that time. Well, there's some people that would place parts of this here chapter, the crucifixion, particularly okay. verse nine. Yeah, so but I think it, it it kind of mingles. I think it sort of mingles the two, because I think Alan White refers refers to verse nine to when. Satan yeah. was cast out of heaven originally, but then he's kind of bound to the earth in a sense, cast out of heaven again at the crucifixion. I think it's kind of mingled. I don't yeah, think it's maybe one or the other. Right. And, and, and sort of him being cast out to the earth at the crucifixion is is related to, um, you know, it, it's it's more symbolic. It's just he was cast out at the beginning. And of course, his influence then occurs. I mean, because there isn't, there couldn't be a literal casting out that happens, um, unless you're saying that he's he wasn't bound to the earth before, but at the crucifixion he is. And I don't know if, if I could support that literal casting out, because um, we know he's going to be bound to the earth, of course, during the thousand years. But yes, well, I sort of see it as. He was originally cast out before the earth was created. And then when mm -hmm. Adam sinned, he had some uh, ability then to go to the, when the councils occurred, as we get in Job chapter 1. 
So he was still yeah. able to have some part of heaven then. But once the crucifixion occurs, therefore that, that access is totally cut off. Yeah. Do we have a statement for that, that his access is cut off at the cross, that he can't meet with the councils anymore? representatives of the different worlds and, and, and really he, by right he should be there in the first place because I mean he he took that unlawfully though he claims it's lawful yeah. I mean I know we have a statement about Ellen White him uh, being cast out at the crucifixion But yeah, so so one thing we can say is that this does jump around a little bit, right? This this you know it's not it's not putting all of this at the time of Christ. Now, as far as this man child, uh, we're going to apply this to Christ, right? We're not going to be applying it to to anyone else. Now, one thing we can say about this child, um, why is this great red dragon that, called the serpent and Satan, why is he in this event symbolically represented? A woman giving birth to a child and a serpent. What does that remind us of? Well, the, the serpent relates to the Garden of Eden. Right. So this is going to go back to Genesis chapter 3, right? Yes. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So we know that this woman here in Revelation 12, because of the context of this child and this serpent, uh, places this as the time in which uh, this prophecy is being fulfilled. So the bruising of the serpent's head is going to occur in this time and the bruising of the heel of the child, right? So, so it's, it's definitely the connection there between this first gospel promise and Revelation chapter 12 can't be ignored. That is, that imagery is being used here. Now, we also have um, how the woman is described. She's clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. So where does this imagery, what does this remind us of? Moon, sun, 12 stars. The... Um Prophecy or the dream of Joseph. So Joseph's dream. So it's going to bring us back to Joseph's dream. Now, how does Joseph's dream relate to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15? How does it relate to the gospel promise? I mean, why does Joseph have that dream then? I mean, it's real, the real question in that way. Well, Joseph have... typifies... Yeah, Joseph typifies Christ. Okay, so he typifies Christ. Yeah, so he's a type of Christ. Uh, we're going to have the 30 years of Joseph, the 30 years that Jesus has to his baptism. Um, so we can see that Joseph it relates. There's lots of different symbols between Joseph and Christ. We also have in that story of Joseph, because remember, we have the promised seed given in Genesis chapter three. And and that's going to be the double portion, the priesthood and um, the kingship that is going to be the right of the firstborn. Right. Because that, and that's where that comes from, from that promised seed. 
And then when you get to the story of Jacob, uh, he's going to disperse that to these 12 sons, right? So the fact that we have these 12 stars here is going to bring us back to the story of Israel. So we can see that the 12 stars represent Israel, which also is a symbol of the church. Now, uh, the sun, so she's clothed with the sun. So we know that the, the sun and the moon and 11 stars bow, to, bow down to Joseph's, Joseph, right, in his dream. Doesn't really say that he's a star in the dream, but, you know, we would have to sort of imply that he's one of the 12 stars. So we have the symbol of the church or of, of Israel, right? And um, so the sun and the moon represent what? In, in the story of Joseph, they represent what? Jacob and Joseph's mother. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, Joseph's mother, of course, is um, not literally going to bow down to him because she'll be dead by the time that dream is fulfilled. But, you know, it could represent his, you know, because um, you have Leah and Rachel. So Rachel's going to be uh, dead by the time the dream is fulfilled. And, and she's going to be dead, actually, when he has the dream. So because she's going to die when Benjamin is born. So but but just symbolically, it represents a man and a woman, the father and the mother of Joseph. Right. Now, in the original story, um, we don't have a sun and a moon referenced. You know, as a symbol, like we don't have the sun and the moon in the story of the seed and the serpent. Right. But we do have Adam and Eve represented in that story. And we also have the idea uh, from Genesis chapter one on the fourth day of creation, when the sun and the moon and the stars are created, they're created for signs, for seasons, for days and years, right? So we know that this also relates to time prophecy. Can we say that? When we have the symbol sun and moon and stars, it's talking about. Uh, that should be correct. Technology, right? So there's signs, right? And, and normally it's a time piece, right? So that re re refers to time prophecies. Now, we know that there was this Revelation 12 sign prophecy that evangelicals did uh, back in 2017. So they had predicted based upon they're going to take this literally. There's a great wonder in heaven, heaven being the sky, and a woman clothed with the sun. So we have the constellation Virgo, which as far as we know has always been represented as this woman in different uh, cultures ever since the time of Babylon. And um, definitely in the time that John is going to write this, it's, it's going to be understood that there is this constellation that's this virgin, right? And then you're going to have uh, uh, the time that the sun is in Virgo is going to be in September. And the moon being under her feet always occurs um, with the beginning of a month, right? So the new moon, right? So the new moon, if you have the new moon when the sun is in Virgo, uh, that's going to be uh, Rosh Hashanah. It's going to be the beginning of the month. And, and 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 of course, just understanding why the moon's under her feet then, because when she's clothed with the sun, um, you're going to have the new moon is going to be next to the sun, right? So it's going to be just when the new moon is seen uh, that you're going to have this happen. So it'll always be when the sun's in Virgo and you have a new moon, that's going to be Rosh Hashanah. So it's going to be different dates in different years on our calendar, but it's just, it's just the start of the seventh month. 
Does that make sense to people? That works. Okay. So as long as people can understand that that's always the case, that if you have the moon under the feet of Virgo, uh, when the sun is in Virgo, that it's going to be Rosh Hashanah. It's going to be the beginning of the civil Jewish year. It's going to be the beginning of the seventh month. Now, normally there's 12 or there's nine stars above her head. That is actual stars, not planets. Now, um, so to have 12 stars, you need three of the planets um, above her head. And, and that, that doesn't happen very often. Um, as far as I can tell, the only time we can, we can find it uh, fulfilled in a um, uh, literal sense would be uh, September 23rd, 2017. Right, so you're going to have Rosh Hashanah uh, in September 23rd, 2017, and that that and that was what they predicted. They predicted that this sign was then seen, and and then of course because of the 1260 days that are going to be mentioned later and how they interpret it, they believe that those 1260 days are literal days in the Bible from Daniel, and that they begin the mark mark of the tribulation period. And so they figured the cigarette rapture was going to happen on September 23rd, 2017. And of course, it didn't happen, right? So it's one of those failed predictions. Now, it happens to be 777 days before November 9th, 2019. And there's lots of other things that we've looked at in connection with that date. But here, we're not going to take this Revelation 12 and say that this is referring to an event in September 23rd, 2017. Right. So we're not going to do that. We're not going to say that because, you know, we saw it, we see this sign in the heavens then that that's an, that is the fulfillment of Revelation chapter 12, because we're going to see that this child here has to be Christ. Right. She brought forth a man child. So this is Israel. Verse five, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron that has to be Christ. And her child was caught up unto God into his throne. So this would be the ascension of Christ. And we know about the woman fleeing into the wilderness. That's going to be the 1260 years of the papacy. But we can't ignore uh, the symbols here that tie us back to Genesis chapter three. And we can't ignore the symbols that tie us to this period of Joseph, to Joseph's dreams. And we can't ignore the symbols that tie us to Genesis chapter one, dealing with the creation of the sun and the moon and the stars and their purposes. Um, but we do have uh, other symbols that it ties us to as well. So it's going to tie us to... Um, Isaiah chapter 7. Can we say it ties us to Isaiah chapter 7? How would we do that? Well, a virgin shall conceive and a son, and they shall call his name a man. Yeah, I was going to quote that. <laughs> okay. So so we, we say we can tie it to there because we have the symbol of a virgin giving birth to a child. And, and Virgo, of course, is this constellation, this virgin, right? And, you know, it's, it's a prophecy that we apply to Christ. The New Testament applies it to Christ. Now, we know its initial application is to the birth of Manasseh, right? In the context of the prophecy of Isaiah 7 and 8, it's going to be the birth of Manasseh that's going to fulfill that prophecy, Manasseh is a type of Christ. Even though he's an evil king, he typifies Christ in overcoming human nature. When he's in affliction, Manasseh is. He's going to repent of his sins. He's going to be converted. And 
Um, so even though he was the most wicked king in Israel, he was only the wicked king for 22 years of his 55 years of reign. So, um, so anyway, so we, we, we can apply it to Manasseh. So we can apply it to that prophecy. And is that prophecy connected with 1260 years in any way? Because it's going to be the 65-year prophecy that's going to be marked by the birth of Manasseh. So that's going to start the 2520 for Judah. Not the birth of Manasseh, but his uh, his being one of the kings that's going to be captured. Because there's two kings. The land shall be forsaken of both her kings. So we know that first Hoshea is taken captive in 723. And then Manasseh in 677. So does that relate at all? Can we take this story of this virgin conceiving and bearing a child, which is going to be Manasseh? Can we tie that to a period of 1260 years? I would think we can. Right. So and that's going to be the first 1260 for northern Israel. Right. Because that's going to start. You got the prophetic mirror starting in 742 when the prophecy is given. And then you're going to have it fulfilled for northern Israel 19 years later when northern Israel is forsaken of its king with the captivity of Hoshea two years before the destruction of Samaria. And then after the destruction of Samaria, you're going to have another 44 years to Manasseh's captivity that starts the 2520 for Judah. But if you're dealing with this 1260 that's talked about in Revelation chapter 11 as well, this 1260 is the treading underfoot. This is the papacy, the one that goes back to Isaiah chapter 7 is going to be addressing the 1260 for northern Israel, the first part of that 1260, which is the scattering. Right. So it's going to address the scattering of God's the, of the power of the power of the holy people. That's going to be scattered with Daniel chapter 12 or seven. OK, so you can see we can take this story. And we, we can we can tie this imagery to these different histories. Now, it says that um, this wonder that appears in heaven, this great red dragon has seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. So as we talked about yesterday, there's various different interpretations that have been proposed regarding these seven heads. Now, if we go back within Christianity um, and how these heads have been understood in the past, um, the idea that it's Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, and Rome, Papal, is a fairly modern interpretation, right? And and then, you know, Papal Rome and the United States and so forth. You, you're not going to see that interpretation of the heads until, probably not until the 20th century. So, so it's a new interpretation. This is the interpretation that we hold to but it's, it's a fairly modern interpretation of the heads. And then you have the ten horns. Those generally are interpreted as uh, the ten divisions of Western Rome when it falls. So the question is, what basis do we have to say that the heads are Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal, the United States, the UN? What, what would be the basis for that? Because we're, we're starting here without, we're saying we have to prove everything. And what would our case be made for saying, based on Revelation 12, that we could make that application? Why would we do that?
So we're going to say that they're, they're the seven kingdoms. Where would, where, what basis would we do that? To say the seven heads of Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, etc. <clears throat> and we're going to base this, we're going to place this beast, we're placing it at the time of Christ. Is there any good arguments that we could put forward to show this? Any scriptures we could look at? Other, other than Revelation 13, 17. Yeah, yeah. So, so Revelation 17 and Revelation 13, we're, we're, we know that those are different beasts, right? So I'm just saying we're looking at, at Revelation 12. And then we're, we're just going to look at this by itself first, right? We're going to look at Revelation 13 and Revelation 17. And then if, you know, we make an argument from Revelation 17, can we then apply it to Revelation 12? But I'm just saying here, if we're reading this, do we have any indication here? Can we go somewhere to the Old Testament? Um to deal with these seven heads. So, so we have these seven heads. Do we have any sort of reference we can use? Uh, what of in Daniel? Okay, so so where do we where do we have seven heads in Daniel? Would we just go to Daniel chapter seven? So if we go to Daniel chapter seven, we're going to have a beasts, these four beasts, right? And you're going to have. Um, you're going to have seven heads, right? Because you're going to have uh, a beast that's a leopard. Uh, let me see, where is it here? Um, so first you're going to have a lion. Lion has how many heads? Verse seven. One. Lion so it has one head, head right? Okay, yeah. this lion is going to have eagle's wings. And then you're going to have... Um, a bear, how many heads does a bear have? One. One, so you've got two heads. And then you're going to have a leopard, and how many heads does the leopard have? Four. Four heads, right? So now we have six heads, and then we're going to have a fourth beast, and how many heads does it have? So it's going to have one head. So we have seven heads, right? So we can, yes. we can look at this story. We can say there are seven heads. Okay. Any place else that we can look for seven heads? What about on the dragon? Well, you're talking about Revelation? Right. Yeah, well, so we're not going to look there because we have Revelation. We're trying to look in the Old Testament where the seven heads come from. Right? Because John, all of Revelation basically is just um, references to prophecies in the Old Testament. Right, so it's taking those prophecies and uh, using those symbols and applying them from the Old Testament. Okay, just even the idea of a head. What what is the where the idea of a head? What what is it? 
like the idea you, that we you, you wouldn't be you life. wouldn't be talking about the kings of Israel, would you? Well, so we have in Isaiah, um, we have the prophecy of Isaiah chapter seven, right? It's going to talk about. Um, um, the head of Syria is Damascus. The head of Damascus is reason, right? So here you're going to see heads applied to uh, kings, right? right. So the idea of the head being a, a king, we, we can see that. But what about the idea of a head being a kingdom? So obviously in Daniel chapter 7, we can see that these beasts are kingdoms and these beasts have heads. Um, right. So that the head, that word head is just rosh, right? It's the first word in the Bible, that ashim, that in the beginning, in the so a head can have lots of different meanings, but it just means the first, right? The beginning. So, so we can see that heads can be applied to kings in, in prophecy. Okay. Any, any other references? Now, of course, we can go back to the head in Genesis chapter 3, right, um, that the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head and the serpent would bruise his heel. So we have head, and in this case, we have heel um, as these opposites here. So I'm just going to go here. Um, Okay, what, what about other things about heads? Because the word head shows up a lot in the Bible. It's a really, really common word. But as far as looking yeah. at it. So. And then... Daniel chapter 2, you have Nebuchadnezzar being called, you are the head of gold. Right. So you've got Nebuchadnezzar, it's the head of gold, right? In Daniel chapter 2. Now, of course, this is a visual, this is a visual image, right, of this, you know, the kingdoms of the world. Uh, the first one is Babylon, and it is the head. So in this one, we don't have a head for each of the kingdoms. We just have it for, for Babylon itself. But yeah, so we have the word head there um, for uh, Nebuchadnezzar, for the image. What else? I'm trying to find this other verse. I can't. Um, it's Isaiah 9. <clears throat> so, so this is continuing this prophecy, prophecy of Isaiah chapter 7. It goes from 9 to 12. Um, but it says here, the ancient and honorable, he is the head, and the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the tail. So we're usually familiar with this uh, verse. Um and then, therefore, the Lord will cut off from Israel, the verse before, head and tail, branch and rush in one day. So here, what is a head representing? If you read in verse 16, for the leaders of this people caused them to err or to err. And they are led of them that are destroyed. So you're talking leadership. Yeah. So so head refers to leadership, to kings, to leadership in general. It doesn't have to refer to a single individual, right? It can just refer to leadership 
as well. And, and for instance, the term archangel in reference to Michael, uh, that word in the Hebrew is the word head, right? Um, substitute is one word. Wouldn't that be talking about true and fa false prophets as well? Um, Well, in this case, what you have is the leadership that is the head and the false prophets are the tails here, right? So it's just saying from from the, from the top to bottom, uh, there's going to be this uh, judgment. Because even here in this idea, the ancient and honorable, he is the head, is referring to uh, leadership that is gone out of the way right so it's not saying the ancient and honorable is is good and the prophet teaches lies is bad at least that's how i read it in the context here because he's going to cut off from israel the head and tail branch and rush in one day the leaders right. of this people cause them to err right often people just take this verse by itself and they look at it as a contrast of you know, the ancient and honorable. Yeah, that's how I'm it. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just saying that 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 this is um this is the leadership. At least that's the way I would take it in the context of this verse. So so yeah, both are bad. Is, yeah. The head and the tail are bad. Yeah, it makes context. sense. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, often I've, I've seen the verse by itself, especially when I was younger, and I would just think it, you know, it was contrasting two things. But in the context here, um, this is referring to those that are leading Israel, both in the leadership, those that have that position of honor, and also those that are the prophets, that both are gone out of the way and both are going to be removed. Okay, so um, just looking at this here, ancient. So these are just the elders, and 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 the word uh, um, honorable. Um, it's kind of interesting. So it's panim. The face, so those are that um, that lift up the face. So, so these are just the elders that are are lifting themselves up, right? Does that make sense? These are the head. These people who are the elders, the leaders, and and then the prophet is is referring to. Uh, just these false prophets, right? Okay. Um, so we got that for head. Now, so when we go back, unless there's some other verses that people want to look at. So when you get to Revelation, back to Revelation 12, and we're dealing with um, these seven heads, uh, this is some kind of leadership, right? So that's that's what heads would represent. That we apply them to kingdoms. I mean, with Greece, of course, Greece is going to be divided towards the four winds of heaven. It's going to have four heads at one point, though eventually it settles down mostly to two heads, um, the Seleucid and Ptolemaic empires. But... Um, and so the one thing we can't say is that these seven heads here in Revelation 12 represent uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, four heads for Greece. You know, we wouldn't do that. 
But we can see that heads do symbolize kingdoms. So there, there is a basis to try to say that these are seven progressive kingdoms, that heads can represent that. Now, if we try to take this prophecy and just place, just place it in the time of pagan Rome, which is what the pioneers do, they place it into the time in which John is, uh, these seven heads, they have as seven forms of government. The ten horns, they have various interpretations of the ten horns. Um, I suggest that they represent. So if you're going to apply this to pagan Rome. And we're going to place this on a line, right? That is, we're going to say that this is, that somehow this, this history of this woman and the dragon is a line. That is, we can, we can draw a line here. We can, we can see that there is a parallel to the other times of the ends that we can parallel it to 1798, we can parallel it to 1989, and uh, we can see parallels to this with the beginning of the 12, the 70 weeks, and that this is referring to something that occurs at the end of the 70 weeks, but also extends all the way to the beginning of the 1260 for um, Northern Israel. So if we did that, I would put the ten horns as being uh, the emperors, right? So that's how I would look at it. If I was going to make an application of the ten horns, not to what happens at the end of pagan Rome and its division into ten nations, but if I was going to take the heads as being the forms of government, I would take the ten horns as being ten kings or ten emperors. Now, but but that's how I would do it. But for now, we're just looking at these these horns or these heads. The heads have seven crowns upon them. The horns do not. So is it best to take these horns and apply them to the, the division of Rome that's going to happen later? Because it's not good, Rome isn't going to be divided into ten or at least I haven't seen it divided into 10. I'm not sure what the Roman provinces are, um, but I haven't seen anybody make that application. But how, how are we gonna take these 10 horns? So we dealt with the heads, we know that they represent leadership. Well, what about the horns? If we start looking at horns in the scripture, uh, what do horns usually represent? That one should be easy. Okay, horns don't normally represent kings. Iran says king, but that's not normally what they represent. So what do no horns normally represent? Okay, well, let's go to Daniel uh, chapter 8. There's a, a verse in Isaiah yep. that talks about horns as strength. Right. Yeah. Horns have to do with military power, generally, right? Right. Okay. So if you look at Daniel chapter 8, you'll see this here. You're going to have a ram with two horns. Now, I'm not saying they always do because symbols can have more than one meaning. But one of the primary symbols of horns on, on animals has to do with its military uh, might. So you have two horns on this ram. So it has horns. Two is added, but that's because horns is in plural in the dual, right? And one was higher than the others, so you know that there's two. Um, and the ram is going to push with these horns, right? So this refers to military power 
or conquest. And then you're going to have a goat with a notable horn. That's Alexander the Great, right? It's going to be going so fast that its feet aren't even going to touch the ground, right? Um, so we also see this in Daniel chapter 11, um, because the idea here in verse 40, where it says, at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him. This pushing is really compared to the pushing of an animal with its horn. That's what animals do when they push, right? They're going to push um, with their horns. So you see, um, uh, let me see here. Just trying to see if we got this. Yeah, um, just gonna look at the word push. And also Habakkuk chapter 3, verse uh, 3, verse 4. Which one? Habakkuk Which chapter 3, verse 4. Habakkuk? Habakkuk? Yeah, 3, verse 4. Okay, so let's look there. Habakkuk chapter 3. His brightness, uh, that's one of the verses I was thinking of as well. I just couldn't remember where it was. Uh, and his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand, and there was the hiding of his power. Right. So this idea of horns here uh, can represent um, uh, power. And, and this is the word, you know, it's commonly translated horn, uh, Karen. And uh, so so it's definitely a valid way of looking at it. And then the other one of pushing was. Trying to think where that was. I can't think of it. Okay. Um, so we can see that the horns then in Revelation chapter 12, um, even though we apply them later to the United Nations, or and then we also apply them to the 10 divisions of Europe, um, even if we were to, to apply them to... Um, uh, you know, to the ten toes, we can see that those different kingdoms, it's going to be these Germanic tribes that come in and conquer Rome, right? So that would be consistent with the idea that these horns are um, related to, to a conquering power. Now, the thing about it is Rome itself is being described this is pagan Rome, as this dragon having seven heads and ten horns, but the horns, the, the Germanic tribes, are not part of Rome. They do become a part of Rome after they conquer Rome. So is there any other way that we could um, we could apply these ten horns? Any other ideas? Some have thought that those 10 horns would be 10 divisions at the end of the world. Right. So, yeah, so we've seen, you'll see a lot of this, especially in evangelical sort of uh, prophecy. Um, you see it in Adventism, too, the idea that there's 10 divisions of the world at the end of time. I haven't seen good evidence for that. Um, I remember, though, from the Keys of This Blood, there was supposedly by Malachi Martin, um, that book had something about 10 divisions of the earth. Um, but I haven't really seen good evidence for that, that, that the world's divided into 10 parts. Uh, you'll see, you know, the Club of Rome has divided the world into 10 divisions. I've seen lots of different explanations about the 10 at the end of the world but if we're going to apply the 10 to the to pagan rome 
um, can we to divide it to, to the 10 ways in which Rome is divided up with the Germanic tribes coming in and conquering Rome? Is that the best way to look at the 10 horns? These 10 powers that come in and conquer Rome. So they become part of Rome, but originally they're conquering powers. Or do we need to have these 10 to be something that's within Rome itself? That's an interesting concept. Yeah. So, you know, I, I mean, I propose the idea that maybe these 10 refer to the, the 10 emperors, you know, all the way up to, to Titus. But, you know, I don't know if I have good support for that. It's just something that I looked at, right? Um, that that was possible. You have these seven heads, the different forms of Roman government. The one that is, if we take the idea that the pioneers had, the one that is, is Imperial Rome, then it would be this period of Imperial Rome in which there is these 10 emperors that are going to successively follow. But I don't know if that's a good interpretation or not. I'm just saying that that's, that's just one that I looked at. But we know that the crowns are not upon those heads, right? Or not upon those horns, they're upon the heads. So you have seven crowns upon his heads. Yes, I think uh, the reason why the crowns maybe are on the on the heads, it's because uh, we find that there are three uh, kingdoms which were uprooted. So uh, at the end, we find that uh, those are not uh, being recognized. Okay, so so the idea that you're stating there is we know that three are going to be uprooted and there's going to be seven horns left, right? But right. we looked at this yesterday dealing with um, uh, the story of Jotham. He's the 70th son of Jeroboam or Gideon, right? And it always talks about 70 sons being slain. But yet only 69 were slain. Because Jotham wasn't slain and he's the 70th. Okay. Um, and, and we could also say that about the seven that are uprooted. Because we look at uh, Rome as having 10 toes. Now you could say, well, the toes, you know, three of them are going to be uh, cut off, right? So you're only going to have seven toes. But the ten are there at the end of the world, symbolically, right? Right. So when the, when, so when the, you know, when the image is smitten, there are ten toes. And so, you know, we'd have to say, well, those ten toes then uh, must be there till the end, e symbolically, even if three are uprooted. So, um, so when it has seven crowns upon his heads, we know the seven crowns are upon the heads of the dragon. Later on, we're going to see in chapter 13 that the, the crowns, there's going to be 10 crowns upon the 10 horns. And that's going to be during the time of the papacy, right? So if three are uprooted, which, which there are three uprooted, but there still is going to be 10. Now we could just say, you know, the papacy controls three of those horns, however you want to look at it. But but you can see the problem there. So these these are some of the problems, you know, that I noticed back, you know, 40 years ago when I first began studying these things. I had a hard time understanding how we could just take that there's seven, this these these 10 divisions of Rome. And, and, and the reason I was interested in it was because of A.T. Jones' discussion with uh, Butler uh, back in 1888. That's one of the conflicts that happened at the 1888 General Conference was over, you know, labeling of these 10 kingdoms, right? So they had a difference of opinion about it. It got a little bit heated, um, you know, which we should try not to do. When we have discussions, but they got a little bit heated and, and Ellen White rebuked them, right? So there was a rebuke over that issue. So anyway, uh, 
The point is, we know that there's still 10 at the end. So even if seven are uprooted, there's still 10. Whatever that means, whether it's just a symbolic number, just like there's 70 sons that are slain, even though only 69 are slain, we still always talk about 70. So we still talk about 10. But anyway, we do have the crowns upon these heads, not upon these horns. So, so we could say that in the time of the papacy, when we get to Revelation 13, that the horns are going to move to the heads or, or to the, uh, the crowns are going to move from the heads to the horns. That is the papacy itself isn't going to be ruling in, as such. It's going to use these 10 kingdoms. It's, its power, its political power is divided among these, among the nations of Europe. So we have some problems in how we understand this. So, so one is we know that if the papacy is one of the heads, that is even in the forms of government that the pioneers suggest that the seven heads represent, the papacy is one of those heads. Right. And so when we start looking at verse 13 or chapter 13, we're going to see, of course, the papacy is one of the heads. That's the position we've taken. In chapter 17, the papacy is riding a beast that has seven heads. And, and could we argue that that the papacy is one of the heads and also the woman? Right. So those are one of the, the questions that we sort of looked at yesterday. But right now we're just looking at the symbols, right? Looking at the symbols, we're not we're not coming to any conclusions at this point. We just want to understand what these symbols are represented in the Bible. So horns generally represent military power or conquest. So we already addressed the verse four a little bit. His tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven. So we're just saying that this goes back and shows us this characteristic of this dragon. But that this drawing of the third stars of uh, third part of the stars of heaven is not occurring in this history. It's something that happened before the creation of the world. Right. So Satan is going to do this deceptive work. He's going to win over a third of the angels. He did he's cast them to the earth. And the dragon, so this is this same dragon, stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So, so this would refer to uh, what Satan is planning in destroying Christ. And we know the serpent is going to bruise his heel, but this child is going to bruise the serpent's head. Right. So she brings forth a man child who was to rule the nations with a rod of iron. We can't take this as anything else than Christ. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So that's Christ, right? So it's pretty clear that this child is Christ. He's the promised seed. And then it says, the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. So 1260 years. So this is going to bring us to the end of pagan Rome, the beginning of papal Rome. So the beginning of the 1260. Okay. So then we have this. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. And prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. <clears throat> so when does this occur? Revelation 12, verse 7 to 12, verse 9. So Stephen and I discussed it a little bit already.
I think uh, this is uh, before the fall of man. That's when uh, probation for Satan and his angels uh, was closed. And, and so normally use this, this verse to talk about the events that are going to happen in heaven uh, prior to the creation of man. Right? Right. Right. So that that's we use this verse because we don't have we don't have any other basis for it from the Bible other than uh, this this passage. So um, you know we don't have some Old Testament prophecy that talks about this war in heaven. We do have Michael and um, and and the prince of the kingdom of Persia and the kingdom and the prince of the kingdom of Grisha having this conflict conflict with Michael. And that's of course in Daniel chapter 10 that it's going to refer to that. So we're going to have Michael referred to there, which we know is Christ. He's he's the chief prince, that is he's the archangel, right? Uh, Michael, right? So he, he's the chief, that's the word Rosh, right? So he's the head of all the angels. There isn't a bunch of different archangels. Christ or Michael is an archangel. He's the one who rules uh, the angels in heaven. So there's going to be a war in heaven, it talks about. Now, now Jesus says, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Uh, what's the context when Jesus says that? Anybody know? You know I was just drawn to that. Uh, that's when, when, when the 70 come back to him and they're 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 reporting on on their tour you know trying to win souls and he says that he's given us power over serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy and tells us not to rejoice that the spirits are subject to us but that our names are written in heaven right so we know that there is going to be um the, the return of the 70s now, he's also going to um, send out 12 at another time. But here uh, it says, after these things, the Luke chapter 10, um, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and the place whither he himself would come. So it says other 70. Um, so this is going to be. Uh, I'm just trying to see here. It says across wherever that is. Um, that's the one chapter. Um, so anyway, I think it's referring when it says the other seventy. I think the idea is it's referring to. Um, the fact that he sent out 12 first, but I just don't know where that is. Right. So when we go here, uh, he sent out other 70. Um, let's see here. Right. So in Mark chapter six, he's going to send forth the 12. Right. And they're going to say, um, uh, and it says, and they went out um, and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed oil, with oil many that were sick and healed them. So here we're going to have the 70 sent out also. Uh, they're going to be sent out two by That's, two. It's yeah. Luke 10, 1, where he sent, sends out the other 70. Right. But I'm just saying where he sent out the twelve. I'm just saying that the fact that he sends out, it says other 70, it's, he didn't send out 70 two different times. He sent out 12 once, and then he sent out 70 another time. Right? Is that correct, or am I wrong? Right. So... And I'm reading in a commentary. Here's what they say. 
um, other 70, rather 70 others, as Dr. Campbell renders for the expression, other 70 implies that there were 70 sent before, which was not the case. It seems to refer to the 12 apostles whom our Lord had previously chosen. So that is, when it says 70 others, you have 12 apostles, and then you have 70, right? He's going to send out the 12, and he's going to send out the 70, right? And an apostle means sent, one who is sent. So he's going to have 12 apostles, but he's going to have an other 70 that he's going to send out. Is that clear? Does anybody want to correct me on that if I'm wrong? Okay, see, um, I can even see the symbolism there when uh, Noah preached the 120. Then there's uh, seven days before the rain. Yeah. There's uh, a 12 and a 7. Yes, and, and Jeff initially applied this at least back in 2013. Uh, I saw him apply it to uh, the period of time, because this is when he first presented this idea of Ezra 7.9. And he was thinking that there's 30 days in a month, always, right? And so he said that um, you're going to have uh, from uh, the first day of the first month to the first day of the fifth month, 120 days. And then from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month, 70 days. And so he took the 12 to refer to the priests and the 70 to the Levites. Could people familiar with that? Anybody not familiar with it? So this 12 and 70 or 120 and 7, all of those are the same symbol. So so 12 and 7 go together, right, in that in that context. But anyway, the point is he sends out these 70. And because um, we're looking at at what this lightning falling from heaven is about. So um, so when you have the return of the 70 in verse 17, they say, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Right. So we saw that this was the same thing that happened with uh, when they sent out the 12. Um, Right. So that, that's Luke 9, 1. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. So we can see the same thing happens here with the 70. They have that same power. They can cast the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And then Jesus says, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give it to you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. And over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So, so when Jesus says, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven, is he just referring back to the past, or is he saying that in what you have are doing? This is, in a sense, a casting out of Satan from heaven. So we know in John, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps, uh, sorry, perhaps he, 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 he was referring to both, but I think he wanted to encourage us that we do have that power if we're of Christ. I know right. I've used it. I mean, I called on Christ to. Banish devils. Yeah. And, and in John, and, uh, okay, go on, brother. Okay. And uh, the way that I understand is uh, when Christ is uh, uh, speaking like that, it's not like uh, there and then, because uh, Satan was cast not that time, but it was uh, before. So okay. it simply means uh, yes. Okay. So in John chapter 12, verse 31, so. Um, uh, he says, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. 
And I, if I be lifted up from the, the earth, will draw all men unto me. So here, Jesus is saying that when he's going to be crucified, now the prince of this world, which is Satan, shall be cast out. So there is a verse that tells us that Satan is going to be cast out at the cross. Okay, so we do have that. So, so uh, Stephen had referred to this earlier, but he didn't give us this verse. Um, now, Ellen White, when she quotes from John 16, uh, this part dealing with uh, the Holy Spirit, and starting verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto, unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. And Ellen White, when she quotes this, uh, in the great controversy, I believe it is. She says, and now shall he be cast out. She she takes that other part of that verse from John chapter 12. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And she adds that to it. So she says, the prince of this world shall be judged and shall be cast out. Now, we know that Satan's going to be cast down to the earth again at the beginning of the thousand years. So can, can we say that there is three casting outs of Satan before the creation of man, at the time of the cross, and before the thousand years? And could we then apply what's in Revelation chapter 12? Could we apply that not just a reference to when the, originally this occurred, because we can apply it there. But can we also say that this occurred at the time of Christ? Because this is what Stephen was suggesting yesterday. That they are now bound to the earth. At least Satan was not bound to the earth because he could enter into that council in the story of Job to represent the earth even though Christ really should represent the earth. Satan came there to represent the earth. Um, but now at the cross, he's bound to the earth, but he's cast out again. And then he's going to be cast out a third time in the sense that he's going to be bound to the earth, but also with no one to deceive, right? He's going to be the sole being some people put the angels there as well, but he doesn't have any people to to deceive because everyone's dead. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to resolve this? Can we take it this way that this refers not just to the original time he's cast out, but also to the time of Christ? Because look at verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens. And ye that dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, but he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. So where is this placing this dragon being cast down to the earth? Christ is setting up his kingdom. Now, we know Christ does set up his kingdom in the first coming, right? It's not the kingdom of glory, but he does set up a kingdom then. And the dragon now that's cast down, he sees that he's cast down. He's going to persecute the woman, which brought forth the man child. So can we place this at the time of Christ?
I wouldn't believe so. Okay. And then we're going to have uh, this woman fleeing into the wilderness with the two wings of a great eagle, right? And she's going to be nursed for a time, times and a half, so 1260 years. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the, with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So it's going to talk even further. It's going to talk about this period of 1260 years. And then it's going to talk about what's going to happen at the end of the world, because there's going to be this remnant of her seed. And, and that's going to be Seventh-day Adventists. They keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we can see that there is this, this progression. I, I would think that you can take this as referring to this war that began in heaven in the past. Right? Now, he was originally cast down to the earth with his, his angels. But this war has continued. And this great dragon, which is the devil and Satan, we also know it has to do with pagan Rome, right? So it's going to be in the time of pagan Rome that this occurs. And uh, we can also say, though, that this is going to lead us to ultimately the serpent being, uh, you know, coming against God's people at the end of time, in the time of the Sunday law. So, so it encompasses quite a bit of time. But the main focal point here is primarily what happens at the time of Christ. So this, this great red dragon that has seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon its heads. And it's going to be a persecuting power. It's going to persecute God's people. Um, but this is a reference to pagan Rome. That's how we have it on the charts. It's pagan Rome. Uh, but it's going to bring us to the start of the 1260 and give us some hint about events after the persecution that hurt, happens during the 1260 years. Um, and then the final, finally, God's church at the end of the world, the Seventh-day Adventist church being raised up. So any other thoughts on Revelation 12 so far? Because there's symbols that we haven't covered that we need to look at. Yeah, verse, uh, even verse uh, 16, we find that uh, the earth is opening the mouth. Yeah. In, uh, Revelation, chapter, yeah Revelation chapter 13 brings the earth to be the United States of America. Right. So we find that uh, there is persecution and uh, people go to the United States of America. Yeah, so it's going to bring us all the way uh, to the United States of America and then with the time of the United States of America, we're going to have the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So it's going to bring us to 1798 um, and really up to, you know, events after 1844, right? So it's, it's going to bring us through that whole period. So it's going to bring us, but the focus is more upon the time in pagan Rome, right? So obviously this woman bringing forth this mad child, this is going to be the birth of Christ which is in the time of pagan Rome, right? You would agree with that? Right. Yeah. Um, but it's going to bring us all the way to the end. And then when we get to chapter 13, it brings us to the end of the 1260. And so we're now going to see this a beast, but this beast is going to rise up out of the sea. So remember, um, in, in this one, uh, there just appears another wonder in heaven doesn't talk us about a beast rising up out of the sea or out of the earth or anything like that. Uh, but in chapter 13, we're going to see the, the beast rise up out of the sea. Um, right. And he's going to be on the sand of the sea. Now, if we think about the earth, uh, you know, the earth helped the woman. And he's standing on the sand of the sea. So, you know, this is a transition between the earth and the sea. But in this one here, um, 
Yeah, it doesn't say anything about this beast other than he's seen in heaven. Right? And when we get to Revelation 17, um, I thought there's a beast that rises up out of the earth, but I think, um, yeah, that's going to be the two horn beast is going to rise up out of the earth. So you're going to have this beast. You're on the sand of the sea. You see a beast rise up out of the sea. And then when you turn to chapter 13, verse 11, you're going to see, see a beast coming out of the earth. So that it's the earth that helped the woman. So this is going to be the United States. But that's when we look at chapter 13. Right now we're in chapter 12. But we will come back to it. So, so what we want to do tomorrow, we're going to, we're going to address chapter 12 still. Obviously, can, we can refer to other things. Um, but we're going to try to, to illustrate this to see if we can somehow place this. We're going to look a bit more at the details of how the pioneers understood Revelation chapter 12. Now, their, their focus always seems to be much more in Revelation 13, even with the Millerites. Uh, they were much more interested in Revelation 13 and 17. Uh, they were, then they were in Revelation 12, oddly. Um, so, um, and, and of course, you know, maybe part of that is just the understanding of the United States. But they didn't have the pioneers, the Millerites, weren't looking for the mark of the beast having anything to do with the Sunday law. But they still focused a lot more on Revelation 13 than Revelation 12. So any any final thoughts before we close with prayer? So if, if people want to, you know, spend some time studying this before tomorrow, maybe you'll have some things that come up uh, that we can address tomorrow. But as far as I can see, we've addressed the symbols that are here, the primary symbols. I mean, some of them are very obvious and, and we know about uh, that we don't really have to look at in detail but okay no more comments okay let's pray dear father in heaven we are grateful for the time that we had here this morning and um, we just ask that you can be with us throughout this day and your holy spirit Continue to work upon our hearts. We ask for forgiveness. And we ask, Lord, that we can represent you in all ways. We pray for each person, for the struggles they face. And we ask, Lord, that you can help us in our, our planning of future meetings um, that uh, we are thinking about, especially with Africa and other places in the world. And I just pray, Lord, that you can help uh, we organize these things. Uh, we pray for Jeff, that you can be with him. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.